Good afternoon, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator with the Havey Institute, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy. Dr. Murphy, how are you doing today? Doing quite well. Thank you. Dr. Murphy is the executive director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID infectious disease or public health questions each week on the Haiti Institute for Global Health Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be addressing the latest headlines and U.S. COVID statistics through today, April 26th. We invite you to submit any questions you have down below via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Starting with the updated U.S. COVID statistics. Average new hospitalizations per day down to 915. The same week in 2023, we saw over 2,000 hospitalizations per day. Average COVID deaths per day, 34. Same week in 2023, 207. New vaccine uptake has remained steady, about 22.8% for adults, a little higher at 41.5 for the 65 plus group and 14% for children. Dr. Murphy, your reactions to those numbers. Well, the, the pandemic is definitely, or the epidemic, the seasonal epidemic has uh, really gone down significantly. We have a, a per daily death rate. Uh, the daily death rate is only 34. That's lowest it's been in quite a while. Um, and of course, a lot lower than last year. Um, so that's all good signs. And the number of new cases is down. Everything is down. Um, and this is what we expect. And so uh, we'll follow this along for the next couple of weeks, but you know we may be de-emphasizing this part of our report um, because it's just going to keep going down, down, down. Okay, so what's the big news? We'll wait for the next spike uh, to come up, and we'll just be focusing on the uh, the different headlines that are coming out. And there's lots of them, so uh, that's where we stand. Absolutely. And on that note, generally, the U.S. respiratory season has been in decline. Can you just give us a brief overview of, you know, the big three? Yeah. The, so this is something that the CDC is really good at tracking, tracking uh, epidemics and spikes and dips and valleys, whatever. Um, and so um, they're finding that, you know, COVID flu and um, RSV are all going down. Um, and they found that uh, taking flu, there's only two places that still have a relatively high amount, and that's Wyoming and North Dakota. Everybody else is uh, on the way down. Um, the uh, respiratory syncytial virus rates are also really kind of bottoming out. Uh, and we just talked about the COVID cases. It's also uh, going down. So this is uh, really what's happening. Um and uh, this uh, impacts outpatient visits, emergency room visits, pediatric hospitalization rates, you know, all sorts of other things uh, in the healthcare system. So it's uh, it's all very good news. And, and this year we did have 142 pediatric deaths, unfortunately, uh, that was from flu. Um, but, uh, you know, now we're getting out of the flu season and uh, the vaccine uptake uh, is, you know, probably we're not even going to be recommending those vaccines right now off season. Uh, and for COVID, a lot of people are waiting for the new vaccine to come out in September. So the booster is recommended now, but, you know, unless we have another like what well, we had it once before with Delta going up in August. So we have to be careful with COVID because sometimes that bounces uh, in other parts of the year as well. But anyway, that's... um. That's kind of where we stand with these, and uh, it's going down. That's good. Mm -hmm. Definitely good news to hear coming out of the respiratory season. However, there was some research published that published this week, excuse me, retrospectively looking back at those RSV seasons over the past few years and looking at those numbers specifically in adolescents, one of the groups who is at high mm -hmm. risk for severe RSV. Can you break down those findings for us? Yeah, so th this uh, was published in JAMA Network Open, a very reputable journal. And uh, they looked at 
over 900,000 um, children under five uh, from 50 children's hospitals in 10 different geographic regions. And they broke them down to RSV infected versus non-RSV infected. And they found that the RSV infected patients, as you would suspect, do much worse. So that's why RSV diagnosis is a really important thing because you've got to really be careful with those kids that it can cause you know hospitalization, ICU admission, and even death uh, compared to the non respiratory syncytial uh, viruses. So overall, about half the people presenting, half the kids are presenting to emergency rooms will have either COVID, RSV, or flu you know, during the season. Um, and the other half have a variety of other respiratory uh, infections, other viruses. They could have strep. They could, they could have a, a variety of things, but they do bad if they have RSV. Uh -huh. And that's why it's super important to look out for the monoclonal antibody that was, you know, authorized under EUA and is available. Hopefully, we'll have more supply yeah. for this upcoming season. Yeah, that that was uh, much more popular than anybody had anticipated. The moms want to protect these uh, young babies. Uh, but the other way they can do that, that's just as effective, if not more, is for the mother to get the RSV vaccine while she's pregnant. Safe and her antibodies is basically the same thing you're you're giving with the manufactured monoclonal antibody, but the mother is making the antibody, passes it on to the baby, and the baby's protected. So there's two ways to protect little kids. Mm -hmm. And both very viable. Yes. But moving on, while COVID has declined this season, the CDC was recently recently releasing new reports, new reports excuse me, about long COVID prevalence among adults specifically and potential need for ongoing surveillance. Can you break down their findings for us, please? Yeah, so we don't really know how much long COVID, we know it's real and we know there's a significant amount of it, but the numbers have ranged from like five or 6% up to 30%, but it's it a lot of that is self-selected bias. You know, people with long COVID go and get studied. All right. Um, so this was a, a huge uh, cross-sectional survey that was sent out, and all the participant data was uh, self-reported, and it was just a one-shot deal. But all 50 states and four U.S. territories, um, and they broke it down by age range and everything, and they came up with a 6.4% uh, of U.S. adults reporting long COVID. Um, and um, it ranged uh, from different parts of the, the country. Uh, one of the lowest was the U.S. Virgin Islands at 1.9%, and the highest was in West Virginia, interestingly, 10.6%. And uh, it, it, it just varied uh, between the, the states and territories. Um, tended to be lower in the Pacific and New England areas and higher in the South, Midwest, and the West. But it, it just, it's it's not even across the country. Um, you know, it's not a perfect study, but it, it just adds more ammunition uh, to the, uh, um, the data that just, uh, you know, say, you know, this is a real phenomenon. A lot of people get it. And, you know, this is what we're going to expect. Mm -hmm. Something and, in this. Yeah. Sticking with long COVID, there was a really neat study published just this week about one of the specific symptoms that many long COVID patients experience, which is the loss of taste or smell. And so, sort of the mechanism behind that. Can you break that down for us? Well, you know, at the beginning, you know, we as, as doctors aren't used to asking, you know, have you lost your taste or smell? I mean, it's just, I never asked that, you know, if a person brought it up, I'd make note of it, but um, it wasn't a routine question. Well, the cases started coming in with COVID and a lot of people were just saying, hey, you know, I can't taste anything anymore. I can't smell anything anymore. And so then when we started looking, of course, then we got an idea how how big a problem this whole thing is. So they um, they looked at it and then they they actually it was a very clever little study. They didn't call it a COVID taste study. They call it we're gonna we're gonna check your uh, uh, it's a smell and taste study. They didn't say anything about COVID. 
So they um, checked out uh, 744 people and they found that 340 of them had prior COVID infection. So that was just like an incidental thing, but that was really what they were looking for. Um, and the people, uh, it turned out it was interesting. The actual taste, like, you know, sweet, sour, bitter, whatever, um, there was no difference between the COVID and the long COVID, uh, the COVID and the non COVID ones. Now, remember, th that's just the history that they had. You know, they could have had a problem with that uh, taste, you know, while they were acutely ill, or maybe it just got better on its own. And we know that happens. But what was interesting here is they found that there were still differences in smell in these people. And uh, so many of them had had COVID a long time ago and their spell is still abnormal in this study. So I think it's a it's a really a, a fascinating study that gets more at the mechanism of uh, what this COVID virus is really, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is really doing. And, uh, you know, it, it, it it's quite dramatic. Yeah, very interesting results to look at. And our final story today is a big one. It's one that's been, you know, rapidly evolving and we've been talking about it a lot. It is H5N1, the avian flu. There are two big questions that were trying to be addressed soon, as soon as possible. One is, how is this virus really transmitting? Is it going from cow to cow, bird to cow, anything else? And two, are our dairy products safe to consume? Well, birds have, birds get it. And the reason why it's important is that a lot of the birds that get it die. I mean, a huge percentage. Um, people can get it, but they get it from the sick birds. There's been really no human-human transmission yet. But because of the high um, mortality rate in birds and the few people that have humans that have gotten it, um, a few of them have died. So, um, you know, we know flu can kill people, but I mean, this is, this rate is much higher. Now, what happens is, and why, you know, we're, we're just worried about it. We're not, we don't have to go all crazy about it right at this particular point. But um, if this virus mutates to the point and it learns how to transmit easier between people, we could be in big trouble. You know, we have a, a H5N1, which is bird flu. We have an avian bird flu that can get humans very easily. What's the mortality rate going to be? Is it going to be 1%, 5%, 10%, 30%? You know, it, we don't know. And that's why there's so much concern, because this is a very, it could be a very lethal uh, thing. So, well, then we found out that the birds can give it to the cows. And then in, in this study here, they're telling you that the cows can actually give it back to the birds. So it's in this cycle with uh, the different herds and uh, uh, with the birds and the cows and, and whatever. So the testing for this is, is, is not well organized. Um, states can kind of do what they want, but now, um, it, they're, they're trying to block sick animals uh, from moving to another state. So at least keep them in the same state uh, before they figure out what to do with them. Um, and uh, that is one way to slow a pandemic down, just you know, keep everybody in place until the, the, the infection uh, uh, plays out. Now, most of the cows that have gotten sick are dairy cows. So the cows that are raised to produce milk. And the dairy cows, um, you know, one of the unfortunate things, they get fed things that have bird products in them and they may have been contaminated that way. Um, and uh, we do know that when a cow does get sick, that virus is heavily concentrated in the milk. So what's the safety of our, what's the status of our, the safety of the milk that we purchase in the store. Is it loaded with avian flu virus? Um, now, milk is pasteurized. Now, if you have raw milk, everything's out the window. You know, you know that could have a variety of different 
pathogens in it. And that's why pasteurization is strongly encouraged. Um, they did PCR testing in milk products. And they found that one in five that they tested, one in five tested positive. Now, PCR will even test a fragment of a virus, not the whole, it doesn't mean that that's actually a viral particle that can cause infection, but it's at least part of a virus that's getting picked up by this PCR test. So that's not the same thing as it infectious, even though it's in the milk. Um, and then the question is, does pasteurization actually kill H5N1 avian flu? And we don't know, but we do know that the flu virus is very fragile, that um, uh, the uh, pasteurization of eggs, which is at a much lower temperature than we do for milk, is effective in, in decreasing avian flu. So you would think, well, if it's a lower temperature kills it in eggs, uh, the higher temperature probably works even better in milk. But we haven't done the study yet, and it's being done now. In other words, to take virus that is infectious in a milk product and, and pasteurize it and then see what happens. So that is ongoing now. But the whole organization, this just smells like the beginning of the COVID pandemic. You know, the, the, the federal agencies are requiring the test to be sent to the central place. And, you know, it just sounds all too familiar. And this has really got to change. Because if this thing starts to transmit, we're in a lot of trouble if this mortality rate um, is higher like we would expect. And mm -hmm. fortunately, you know, there is treatment and several companies are making vaccines human for human vaccines for, a, for H5N1, for the avian flu. They're, and they're almost ready to go. So, you know, if, if that comes out, let's just make up a scenario. What if this kills, instead of one in 100, like COVID, what if it killed one in 10? This is going to make the COVID pandemic look like peanuts. So, you know, the, but the vaccines are almost ready to go. Um, and they may never have to be used. But at least I think we're going to be ready uh, on the vaccine side. And the treatment side is okay. Uh, there are some drugs that we can use to treat flu, um, but the best thing is prevention. Um, and uh, we'll we'll see what happens. But this this is an evolving story. Uh, they're also looking at pigs now because uh, pigs behave a little bit more like humans and cows or birds. Uh, and you know they have it. That's just starting. So uh, it's a it's kind of a scary time um, with. Uh, with uh, this uh, situation. And we'll be talking a lot about this uh, in the future until we figure out exactly what's going on. Right. And as of today, there's only been 30 some herds that have been confirmed to be positive for H5N1 in the US. Right. How is it that there are so many products then testing positive for some viral content? Is there more asymptomatic well, cows than we expect? Something like that? Well, this is a, a really good point. Um, first of all, the, the testing is PCR testing is really super sensitive. Like I said, though, it doesn't tell you if it's an infectious particle, but it means that a lot of the cows out there that are providing milk and putting milk into the system um, are not being tested. Um, or there's a whole lot of asymptomatic infection going on out there that we don't even know about because there's no mass screening going on at, uh, at this time or has ever gone on. So the FDA says, if the cow's infected, you cannot uh, uh, distribute the milk. You can't market the milk. Um, and what if we find out that 20% of all the cows are, are infected and don't have any symptoms? What are we gonna do with that milk? Are we gonna take it out of the system? Uh, are we happy with the pasteurization process? Um, these are big and very important questions. So um, I think we'll be hearing a lot about this 
in the next few weeks as this uh, plays out. But uh, and what are we going to do with these cows now? You know that are testing positive. Uh, it's really uh, it's it's crazy time. The birds they've been culling like mad. They've killed millions of birds, uh -huh. um, and it, it's so lethal with them anyway. But uh, yeah, they'll they'll just kill huge flocks and you know you know chicken factories full of them and uh, without even batting an eyelash. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that's already ongoing. I don't know what's going to happen with the cows because it looks like the cows are, they get sick, but they're not dying at the rate that the birds die. So mm -hmm. I don't know. There's a lot we have to learn uh, from this cow uh, uh, infection uh, story. Yeah, we'll just have to wait and see and hope that we get more data published soon that we can really dig into and share with you all. But on that note, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Murphy, for your time and your expertise, breaking down all of these headlines and bringing us towards the end of the respiratory season. Thank you so much. Right. Okay, have a great weekend. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions you would like to be addressed by Dr. Murphy, please feel free to comment them down below or send them to any of our social medias linked in the description. Have a nice weekend.